I had about seven shrines um, because I told you I got initiated. So during that initiation time, it was eight days, supposed to be three. The spirits extended it, ended up being eight days. I'm naked, wrapped in white sheets, um, doing rituals morning, noon, and night. Complete silence. I'm not, I don't speak. I'm mute for eight days. No talking. Hey, y'all. Hey, it's your girl Lala Jenkins back with another YouTube video. So in this video, I brought my girl Delena on to share her denouncing testimony. But before I actually get into the video, if you haven't already, hit the subscribe button. If you grow one time for the one time, come on, give a good roll for G. Zus. Um, and so, like I said, I am Lala <laughs> and I am from Arlington, Texas, which is about 20, 30 minutes from Dallas. Ag Town was good. And so I denounced or I crossed, let me start there. I crossed into Delta Sigma Theta in spring of 2008. It was April 2008 and I denounced in September of 2021. So I was a Delta about 12 or 13 years. I was very active in my chapter. I was chapter president. I was stepmaster. I was like the Delta on campus and so once I actually graduated and I came back to Dallas because I crossed from Houston once I came back to Dallas the Lord started separating me from pretty much the world he started separating me from the world and Delta was a part of that separation and so in September of 2021 the Lord said come out from among them so I'm doing this denouncing testimony series to pull more people out from among them okay this is the charge the mandate the assignment that the Lord has placed on my life is to go back and get the rest and so the holy spirit invited delena on to share her denouncing testimony of denouncing su row okay so thank you delena so much for joining today and saying yes to god being willing to share your testimony and so before we actually get started can you just talk to because i haven't been asking this question on i need to so where did you cross it and what okay. year um, I pledged in 2010. I crossed May, I think it was like May 5th. Mm -hmm. um, look, I don't forget. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Um, I think it actually was May 2nd, 2010. Kappa Epsilon Sigma Chapter, Bloomington, Illinois. Um, I went to ISU for my undergrad degree and my master's degree. Um, and I pledged the final semester of my master's program. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you did, you did alum chapter. Alum I the graduate chapter. That's the Graduate right. chapter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so thank you for that. So my first question is how were you introduced to Greek life? Greek life, uh, high school, high school, you know, um, I, I went to high school and I started high school in 95. And in 1996, we had a step team. I joined the step team. That was my initial exposure. My my step team, we were really good. We were one of the only schools in the Chicagoland area that had a step team. We were one of the original teams. I don't know if we were good or just connected, but we actually ended up being participants at the 1996 stomp competition that was um, televised on NBC. Um, so if you know um, A.J. Johnson from House Party and uh, Alfonso Ribeiro, they were the hosts at the time. So this is like 90s pop culture, right? Greek pop culture. So um, we were there. We have um, some students who actually even performed with some of the teams on the stage. But behind the scenes, we performed for the Greeks. Um, at their practice, we were at the hotel with them. So this was the ex this was my original exposure to Greek life, besides like movies like School Days, right? Um, <laughs> and then also, so after this uh, going to California for stomp recording and being on the step team, I actually became a Dale team um, in Chicago. Um, I had a mentor from my church who took she saw I was super interested in stepping, and she was a Delta. She took me under her wing, introduced me to Dale Teens, you know, and this this group is of high school girls and they focus on leadership development, scholarship, college prep. And I'm a first generation college student. I didn't know anything about college. My mom didn't know what to do with me for that. So this program, I remember they brought in a financial aid uh, officer from the actual college I ended up going to, Illinois State University. 
they brought him in um, to the DST house in Chicago. And um, he taught seminars on how to apply for financial aid. So this is all the exposure that I that I didn't have access to. Um, and because of my connection with the sorority at the time, I got that information and I was able to go to college, find out about interest exams and things like that. And so when I got to college, um, Delta was pretty much all I knew. It was what I had seen up close in person for three years. And it was the glamorous. It was like what I was pursuing. Um, when I got to in my mind, what I thought I wanted when I got to college, um, I got to college in 99. Um, I went to Illinois State University and there were no Deltas at the time. There were no AKAs at the time. The AKAs had their charter revoked completely. Um, they actually just came back like maybe a year or two ago. But anyway, so I kind of lost interest in Delta because the, even the ones that were there were really mean. And so I was like, eh, nah, I'm probably not going to do that. But I was still really close to the Greek life. I dated a guy who pledged Alpha my freshman year. He cheated on me with a Zeta. They had a baby, broke my heart. And that's how I ran to the church. Do you hear me? I got super saved. <laughs> and so, um, and that's how I, but even during that time, like I worked as a student support specialist for Greek affairs in the student affairs office. So I would compute the grades for the Greeks. I would measure and make sure they were doing their community service. I was really close to the Greek life on campus. I also became what's called a Phi Beta Sigma Carnation. So like a auxiliary group or sweetheart group before they were banned on campus. So my freshman year in college, I was a Sigma Carnation. I was in their like little sister group, right? Their mentoring group. And I had to renounce that, too, because there's a whole there's a there's like a pledge and night that we do um, as the auxiliary groups. Um, and I'm still connected with some of them on Facebook. I, you know, they're really good guys. They don't you know, I don't think they know that what they're doing is sin, but I'm, that's what we're going to talk about today. So Sigma Carnation did that and eventually um, end up getting saved in my undergrad. Um, but prior to that, let me say this, too. I was raised in a church. I got filled with the Holy Ghost when I was like seven. So um, I knew very well the scripture. I went to a Christian school. I was taught scripture, all of that. Um, and so, but as I got in high school and everything like that, I wasn't as involved in the church, right? And I started doing like teenage things outside of the church, right? <laughs> but when I got to college, suffering from that heartbreak is when I really found myself um, getting back with God. So, but yeah, that's my introduction. I, ha I had a real, I was really deep in Greek life before I even pledged. Um, really not deep in it, but very close to it, probably closer than the regular GDI. <laughs> Do we use that term? <laughs> you know what? That, and that, that's a term that, that, that they label us, which is the non Greek GDI. And you, the Lord gave me revelation on what that means. It means God damned individual yeah yeah and so basically basically they call us if you are not greek you are damned by god that's what it's a lie it is a lie devil is a lie okay a lie. I, said, I said in my denouncing video i'm like i'm a gdi now and i just felt the holy ghost i, I was like oh and grab so you up me, yeah i was like why do i feel weird when i say that and so yeah. the whole gave me revelation if that's what gdi means god damned individual yeah so yeah i um you know what actually in college also so when i tell you that i, I ran to jesus in the midst of that this I, I, this was probably in like 2004 by this time i um i also i had prayed and i asked god should i still pledge dst because that's what i originally wanted to pledge. That's all I knew. They had come back to the campus and I'm like, okay, let me ask God, what should I do? And he clearly told me no, gave me a resounding no. And he gave me three reasons why. And I will never forget these three reasons why. And I didn't fully understand all of them at the time, but this is what I heard. No, because my glory, I will not share with another. Two, that shall have no idols before me. And three, and not necessarily he gave them to me in this order, because this is the first one he gave me, was you should not have your service 
um, you should not boast of your service to other men. And the organization will always say we are a public service organization. We serve others. This is what we do. And he showed me Matthew 6, where it talks about you should do these things in private and the Lord who sees you will reward you openly. And so those three reasons he told me, this is not of me. Do not do this. Right. And so I accepted that. I later went on to find out um, because I I actually knew like Fred Hatchett and this lady named Gail. I didn't know who they were then, but somehow I got co connected with them. They were in ministry. They were doing like, like don't go Greek type websites. Like, but this is like when websites was super, uh, like super plain, right? So they, so at that time, you know, I ran into them and I came across some of the ritual and esoteric information for the Greek letters organizations. I didn't have any idea of what I was reading. I didn't understand, right? But I saw, a, I came across a hymn um, for one for that organization that talks about um, gl glory. So I knew that this is what God was talking about, These this worship hymn, he, where he's saying, thy, you know, we give glory to thy name. And this is why he's saying he's not gonna share his glory, right? So I took that and I said, okay. And I actually joined a Christian sorority in 2004. Um, this sorority, this group did everything right. The only thing I think they did wrong was in their zeal to fit into university culture. They called themselves a sorority. They should never have done that. They should have just said, we are a sisterhood. We are a college um, organization campus ministry, and they should have stuck with that. We got to stop trying to look like the world. We don't need to look like the world to appeal to God's children. We can find our identity in him and we don't have to, we are not an alternative. And so I think that's the thing that they did wrong. But outside of that, I joined that organization, the Christian disciplines that they instilled were so on point. We prayed every morning at 4 a.m. for five weeks. We fasted. We prayed. We did Bible studies in addition to that. We memorized scripture. I mean, we 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 were together. There was no hazing. There was no humiliation. No degrad they they prophesied to us. They built us up in the most holy faith. You understand? They mentored us. It is a very close-knit process giving all glory and honor to Jesus Christ and discipling us. And it really, I really should have stayed with that. But they tell us like, if you're in that organization, you cannot join a Greek letter organization. Once you do, you're out. Right. So I knew that and I no longer desired to pledge. I joined Elohim and I was in that. And then right around 2008, the chapter went dry. There were no other women brought in from 2004 to 2008 and i i wanted more and i think this is i'm kind of jumping ahead of your questions lala i hope that's okay what's your next question let me see no go for it yeah <laughs> I, I, was, I was gonna ask like how you know how was you, you getting into yeah how did i get away from it yeah but you're going so, go so this is this, in hindsight i realized the enemy is strategic he one of the things the enemy does when he wants to sift someone as weak, because that process is slow. OK, when he's shaking you out, it's slow. So one of the things he does is pull you away. He's got to pull you away from your community, pull you away from your support, pull you away from correction. Right. However, that looks, whether it's through the hardening of your heart, whether it's through offense, whether it's through changing location, whatever that looks, whatever that strategy looks like. And that's what happened to me. So around about 2008, I left my home church. Um, I'm in grad school. I'm drowning in grad school, suffering with depression. You know, um, it's in central Illinois. So I'm dealing with racism and discrimination all the time. You know, it's a rough area. It's a rural kind of area. Just all these things were happening, right? Um, and I began to look for something else to fill the voids of the connections, the communities. And so in my mind, I go back to what I know, community service, sisterhood, relationships. Maybe I should pledge now because the Christian sorority ain't nobody around no more. You know, um, they ain't meeting. 
they ain't got no connections in the world. I'm finna get a job. I'm finna have a master's. Maybe I should do something else, right? Because this is kind of dried up. And it was interesting because it was called the Cherith Brook chapter. And because every chapter in the, in the organization is named after something from the Bible. So it was called Cherith Brook. And if you know that Elijah, God sent him to the brook to be fed by the ravens, right? In the time of drought. And but then the brook dried up, that place of provision dried up and God, he had to follow instructions and go to the next place. So this is what I think is happening to the chapter. This is what the, this is what the enemy told me. So this this brook has dried up. You know, do something else now. So I thought, okay, maybe I should start pledging. So I had my mentor inside of the Christian organization. Um, love her so much. We've gotten very close. She was a member of Sigma Gamma Rho. Previously, she had renounced, and she was going back. She was starting to be. She was still connected to the women. They were still her friends. And I saw them and I liked it. And so um, I started watching. And this was maybe like in 07. I started watching being like in time went on and I had made a decision in my heart that I was going to do this. Now, I knew God had told me no about DST. I had, um, AKA was never an option for me. Because of the because of stereotypes, right? Zeta, you know, I had friends that was Zeta, so I, I could have considered them too. And you know, at the grad level, you pretty much need to be in, you need to be invited, right? Um, but so in Bloomington, I, I had leadership roles in different community service organizations like the National Urban League. Um, I would I had I was still doing community service. I was still active, so people knew my name. I was helping to produce a radio show. I was still active on campus. I was doing these things. So if I wanted to, um, if I wanted to engage with these women in these in these sororities and the, at the grad level, I had relationships with them and I could express interest if I wanted it to, right? But I I was looking at SG Row, and um, I watched for probably about two years. And I explained prior to that two years, I explained to my mentor at the time, hey. I like your sorority. I'm interested. I looked at the national programs. Their, their focus is the youth. They're not haughty. They're friendly. I had all my reasons, right? Plus, God didn't say no to them, right? They don't have a false God. Now I know about Minerva, right? So I'm like, they don't got no false God on their shield. We, we can roll. We can roll with this. So, okay. She told me no. Don't do it, Delina. She said, um, stick with Ella Jane. Don't pledge. I'm like, you wilding out. This was my last talk with her because she passed away a few weeks later. And I said, hey. I yes, I'm going a, I'm to a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bust it down for you. Go ahead. I said, how can you tell me that and you love them so much? These your friends, you pledge. You going, she was about to reactivate. If she hadn't already, she was in the process of it. And so she was like, I know, but not you. Don't do it. Stay with God. And I didn't understand that. And I was like, I love you, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to play it. I'm interested. I'm interested, interested. Okay. She passed away suddenly. Diagnosed with the big C. I don't want to put too much business out too much of her business out in the streets, but within a few months, less than a year, she was she had passed on. And at her, even though I don't know that she was financial, but they still conducted the Omega Row ceremony at her funeral. And to me, oh they sisters to the end. They love her. I'm this is really sucking me in now. Right. Time goes by. I tell the Christian sorority, because now I'm serving as a graduate advisor to the Christian group on campus. And I tell them, if you don't get some, you need to get some members in this chapter and y'all need to get busy. I said, I give y'all one year. If y'all don't start busting moves in one year, I'm out and I'm going to pledge. So they praying for me. The advisor is like advising me like, sis, don't do it. Now, the culture of the Christian sorority is 
you can't have two. They're, they're saying it's either God or these orbs. These orbs are not of God, but they never tell you why. They never told me why. I never had an understanding besides what God had told me in 2004. I didn't understand why the church kept on saying these secret societies are bad. I just thought they're not on the inside and they don't really know, so they don't like it. All right. So I give them their time. Time. My, meanwhile, a friend of mine from grad school has pledged. And now I'm really like, girl, how could you be pledging and not tell me? I think she pledged it at the end of 08. I'm like, say less. Next line, I'm on it. Right. I'm continuously becoming more and more determined to do what I want to do. Right. My heart is being set further and further and further. And this is going on over a span of more than two years. Now, at first I thought when I was when I sent you that testimony draft, at first I thought I fell away after I pledged. But over the last week, I feel like God showed me that I started falling away from the time I left my home church. OK, so it was little things. The scripture says that it's the small foxes that destroy the vine. It was little things like boyfriends. Maybe drinking here a little bit here or there. Um, a curse word here or there. Do you see what I'm saying? The compromise was just creeping in over the years. And I will repent. I, I found another church. I was going back to church. But then I even started ministerial training. I was helping with the campus ministry. Right? So I'm trying to do the things I think I know to do. Um, but there's still something behind the scenes festering in my heart, which is pledging this sorority. I'm thinking of all the things that can be offered to me if I do this. So I go ahead and express my interest to the chapter. There was no pre-pledging. I'm jumping into your next question. There was no pre-pledging. Okay. You simply just express your interests and they are friendly. OK, the women of Sigma Gamma Rho generally are very friendly across the board. That helped to solidify what I wanted to do. Right? That drew you in. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. And and so that's what happened. And when it was when they had the interest meeting, I went, we chatted, we talked, you know, I had my interviews um, I believe that I had a dream. I, I sort of asked God a little bit. Not really, though. OK, because I did kind of sort of ask him and I, I had a dream that I don't remember. And I said, well, if he wanted me to remember, if he wanted me to know that it was important, I will remember it. And if he don't want me to do it, he won't let it happen. I did that one. I did the lazy fleece test. <laughs> if he don't want me to do it, it won't happen. It won't work out. And so I got the money. You know, it was maybe just under two, two G's at the time. And I did it. I pledged. It was um, they have the they have an official process, a torch process, they call it. It's a really teaching intensive process. That's the uh, official process of the organization. Um we wanted to we wanted to pledge but they was like we not pledging like how undergrads pledge we don't do that um for grad chapter but my my dean she did allow us to meet um in the, in at night and do um unscripted things with us recitations physical like calisthenic like exercise type things um, she talked a little smack, you know what I'm saying? Like, give us a little greeting. Like, it was real. Um, it was like low budget pledging. You get what I'm saying? Like, for some for somebody that's nearly 30, um, one of my one of my uh, line sisters at the time, she was in her 50s. You know, she was somebody's grandmother. God bless her. I love her. And then um, there was one more that was younger than me. It was three of us. And we wanted to pledge. And we showed up. When she told us to be somewhere, we showed up. How many people were pledging, y'all? Was it just the dean? It would just be, um, it would, I don't want yeah, it was like two people. So two people pledging, y'all? Yeah. 
Okay. But it wasn't, um, I mean, it could have been more. She probably got more. She didn't give us everything that she got. I could, I know that much. The thing about the whole organization is it is a counterfeit of the church and um, legal spirituality. Okay. The pledging process resembles a consecration. What you would do if you were exempt, showing that you are a devotee or a disciple of Jesus Christ. Because they give you rules when you start out. You have your list of things. The first day online, you taking notes because you got to do these things. You got your timekeeper. You got things you can and cannot eat. You got what you can wear, what you cannot wear. You have, you know, they telling you no sweets, no sex, everything, all your rules, right? You get all those things. That's the type of consecration. You need to buy these things. You need these clothes. You need this type of notebook. You need this type of bag. This is your first um, project. You need to sew a pillow. You need to, all these things, right? And I also later learned when I began to practice a uh, false religion that when you give in offerings to the to the deities, to, to small G gods, they also give you lists of things that you have to do. To sh- and the part of it's the consecration, right? You're setting yourself apart for them, right? But you're also giving them your agreement. You're also jumping through the hoops that they tell you so that they know that you are agreeing to do what they're putting in front of you, right? Okay, so we did that. We don't do sex. We exercise. We meet when they tell us to. And to some people, it might seem like, oh, that's just pledging. But what I think a lot of people who, what I think a lot of Christians don't realize is it's a setup. You know, if I tell you to not have sex, if I tell you to not eat certain things, what is happening is in the spirit realm, it's all the same. You're setting yourself apart. You're saying to those deities, I offer myself to you. I want to be I want to be used by you. I I open the door for you to come into my life. And that's what is happening at the beginning of the pledge process from night one. When you get your list, this is what's happening. So we we played, we was on, the process was like 42 days, something like that. Did the rituals. And I'm all along, I'm thinking like, well, this ain't so demonic. Yeah, we got to wear all black. Yeah, the lights is off in the room. Yeah, we got candles. Okay, we kneel down. Completely ignorant of what an altar looks like. Completely ignorant of what these things represent i'm just participating thinking that if nobody comes out cloaked in a in a black cloak or nobody says put your blood in this chalice that is not wickedness i was active for 12 years yeah so i was about to say how so how was how was your life when you crossed into the org how did it change not as you were god um so spring of 10, finished grad school. I man, I probably one of the first things I did was wanna go get me a, a boyfriend as Omega. For sure. Come oh, on. Lord, help me. Come on with that oof I love. What's up? But go ahead. Silliness. So I did that. You know, just lukewarm. I just got real lukewarm. You know what I mean? Like dabbling here and there in sin, you know, not thinking. I just kind of, I just, and before I knew I was full on backslidden, going, we was having thirsty Thursdays with the sorors, getting together, drinking, laughing. I was the one at the table. They used to say, I always had a word. I had wisdom. They would ask me for advice. What do you think about this? But I was not walking in holiness. You know, there was a woman um, who was a member of the sorority. She was having issues with her husband. I coached her through it. You know what I mean? Pray with her. This is the thing, like, it was still in me, but I was not living above reproach. You know what I mean? I was compromising, and I I didn't see it at the time. I just thought, like, it's not that bad, and I'm just living life, and I'm in my 20s, and why not? You know what I mean? I'm having fun. This is is okay. But about 2012, um, things were really good, you know, 
I'm in the grad chapter. I mean, we kicking it. I have my dream job working for the state. Girl, why I end up losing that job? They accused me of something I did not do. First of all, I went to work one day. God gave me instructions to do something. I did it. Totally humiliating, totally embarrassing. I was the only black person working in that office. I didn't want to talk to these, these white women about this, but I did it anyway. Long story short, they went back and said I did not do that. And I got terminated. I'm like, oh, God's going to defend me. I put my faith in him. I'm, I'm trusting him. I'm waiting on the Lord to defend me. Girl, I lost everything. Sleeping in the car. <laughs> Sleeping with my, at my family members' houses. Showering at the LA Fitness. Yeah, went low. What? Low. Couldn't right understand it. I could not understand what was happening. Mm. I ended up moving from Central Illinois back up to Chicago. I'm waiting on a hearing with the union so I could tell my story. They called me the night before the hearing and said, you ain't having no hearing. Case closed. Dead issue. Girl, what? Complete injustice. And my heart was broken because I could not understand why God didn't help me. Why was I going through all of this from the end of 2012 until the beginning of 20, 2014? So almost so a year and a half, I'm suffering. I'm waiting. I'm I'm speaking. Now, now I'm ready to, I've tightened up a little bit. I'm still compromised. I'm still smoking a little weed every now and again, right? <laughs> but I'm, I'm still waiting on God, right? Just, just double-minded. That, if I be honest about it, that's really what was happening. Um, just still, I, I might have thought I was on the fence, but I wasn't really on the fence because ain't no in-between in the kingdom. You know what I mean? I was really backslidden. And, but so after that, I really, I was just heartbroken. I was just disappointed. I didn't understand. And I began to lose my faith. Maybe like in the spring of 2014, um, the climate in the country was one of injustice towards Black people. We're seeing things like the Ferguson killing of, um, what was the young man's name? Mike Mike Jones. Was it Mike Brown? Michael Brown? Brown. Yes, Mike Brown. I always say Mike Jones first, you know? Girl, Mike, you know, like, back then they didn't want me. Come on now. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so, you know, the climate was heavy. There was a lot of racial pressure. Um, and so at the same time, I'm taking the information off of social media that is against Christianity, that is saying, like, this is not our God. This country is not for us. This religion is not for us. You know, people keep saying, let's pray about it. But what does prayer do? So this is what I'm doing. I'm feeding myself this information through my eyes and my ears. And it's fueling the disappointment that I already have from suffering and losing what, you know, my happiness. My, I thought I had arrived. I thought I did everything right. I went to grad school. I have a job. I pledge. I'm doing community service. I'm a good person. Why God didn't help me? This ain't my God. So I started praying to the ancestors. I said, let me figure out what else I can do? I, I began seeking out other spiritual solutions to my problems. Let's talk about this because this is going on now. Expose it. Now, what happened? Yeah. Who you was praying yeah. <laughs> Girl, demons. But I didn't know that. You yeah. know, I thought, I thought, okay, spirit, energy, energy doesn't die. It just changes forms and people don't die. You know, people die. They just... They don't go to heaven or him. Maybe they still around to help us and God can you girl, all this foolishness, right? That sounds good. It sounds intellectually good, right? It massages the pride. It massages your heart. It creates comfort because remember I'm broken. So now this is going to bring comfort to me. So, and I'm getting answers. If I, if I could, if I would pray and ask for something to the universe, right or to the ancestors i would get an answer in the form of something i would read in a book somebody would call me 
I know now that the enemy can filter in information to you, right? To make it seem like you're on the right path. And that's what was happening to me. Um, so I'm thinking things are lining up. Things are looking better. So I started learning about other religions, traditional religions. I was listening to a popular Pan-Africanist named Dr. Umar Johnson. Um, because he talks, I'm a social worker, so he talks a lot about social injustices, education system. So all these things is like right up my alley. School to prison pipeline. I understand all these things, right? So he, I find out that he practices Ifa, which is a traditional um, or indigenous African religion. Traditional in the sense of it's, uh, it belongs to the Yoruba people of Nigeria, West Africa, okay? And this is their ancient religion. Voodoo is also originates from West Africa. And so a lot of people know about like New Orleans voodoo, right? But it looks quite different from West African voodoo, okay? So I started getting information about all of these things. So how I really fell into E5 was I went to one of his live lectures in Chicago. He began to talk about he had on all his aleke, all his necklaces and stuff. I got some pictures too I can send you later if you want to filter those on. <laughs> so I saved some from the deliverance. Most of them I deleted though. But he has on his garb that day and he he says, we need to learn how to pray to the gods that our ancestors prayed to. We don't know who we calling on now. This person that that everybody's always praying to now is not for us. Look at where we are in this country, in the world, across the diaspora. African people are at the bottom. So we need to learn how to pray to the gods of our ancestors. And he, he begins to talk about the system that he practices, right? And he says that they're called, the, the deities and the little g gods are, are called Orisha. And he says that these, he teaches that these Orisha are carry characteristics of nature, but also are like personalities of the almighty God. He says there's one God, right? You know, a lot of these different religions will tell you that God is one. They know enough to say that, right? So, you know, that's the thing about deception too. It's going to give you a little bit of the truth and then it's going to filter in its lies with it. So he says, you know, these are personalities of of the one God. So I won't name their names, but this God, this deity is the personality of fire and, and anger and the kingly. This one is love and sensuality and reproduction. And this one is transition and crossroads and decision making. And this one you have to go through to get to all the other ones, kind of like, like what uh, the Europeans call Jesus. This is what he's teaching. Right. And so and how it looks in Judeo Christian Christianity, he says, which is a lie, he says. Um, so just like the Jews or the Christians would say, like Jehovah Shama or Jehovah Jireh, instead of those personalities of the one God, they would say like Shango or Oshun. These are personalities. These are other names that the one God goes by. So I'm like, that sound good. I'm like, that's good. <laughs> yeah, that sound demonic. Wow. I feel I bought it. I bought it. I bought that these deities were the go-betweens for the one God, the almighty God. And it resembled the culture that I was stolen from that I did not have the privilege of knowing because of racism, white supremacy, transatlantic slave trade, that I needed to connect to this African religion as a way to connect to my stolen identity. My Lord, that is what, that is what's happening now. Mm -hmm. This belief is Very being now. Yeah. yeah. So Ooh. Suddenly, I get invited. It's like an Easter Sunday. I get invited to an E5 meeting. Mm -hmm. Out of nowhere. It's not out of nowhere. It's all strategic. The enemy's bringing me these things, right? So I go to my first meeting. Long story short, I ended up going to those meetings every week, sometimes more than once a week for almost three years. 
Um, I ended up being initiated. Um, <laughs> Girl, you want to talk about that? Yeah, I was getting I was getting divination. So so like even from my first um my first divination. So they you know they lay out a little mat on the table. They ask you your parents' name, your date of birth. So they're getting all these inform all this information from you so that they can read, so they can open these doors. That's what divination does. Divination is an illegal means of attaining information from the spirit realm. Anybody can get information from the spirit realm, but is it Jesus is the only legal door? Jesus is the door. He is how you attain things legally through his spirit. He is the spirit of prophecy. But there are demons that can also bring information, but it's illegal. And it's not always true. Okay, so divination accesses the spirit realm of information and technology illegally. So from my first divination, he starts talking about my father. I think I mentioned that my father passed away when I was like five. So he has me, I, uh, the person I'm saying he is a Babalawo, which translates in Yoruba to father of secrets. Now, if, if you know about the occult, you know, the occult simply means secret. It means hidden. So this is, I'm into the occult and don't even know it. So this Babalawo, um, you know, he's so, man, this man was so smart. He was so kind. He was funny, so personable and charming, big in stature. I mean, he was like, if you wanted a daddy, he was the daddy. You know what I mean? So for somebody who probably who was struggling with an orphan spirit, abandonment, now I'm heartbroken and, and depressed, disappointed, unloved, disconnected. I am. I am getting what I need. He tells me to make an offering for my father. My father's stuck in his journey in the underworld. Girl, my father been dead up 30 years probably by this point. Okay. So I do it, child. I did every offering they ever told me to do when I was getting in divinations through the years. I did it. All the what type of offerings. Girl, blood sacrifice. What you mean? Wait. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I we was going here in this testimony. What type of sacrifice? Yeah. Uh, this is why the blood of Jesus is so important. Because um in the spirit world, is there's order. The spirit world, there is a system. Okay, that system cannot be broken, that system cannot be changed. Blood is necessary in that system, it is part of the it is the greatest currency. In that system and also the currency of the kingdom of god is your faith so the enemy has a counterfeit of that he has the opposite of that you can use your faith in the occult as well you're going to use blood in the occult as well you're going to use money you're going to use effort okay so all those things work when you make an offerings um in the false religion in the in in the occult okay so if he said you know, we need a guinea bird, you go buy a guinea. If he say you need a rooster, female root, you're going to go get it. going to get a female chicken. And, and you're going to pluck the feathers out. You gonna, They're going to cut his neck off, shed his blood. You're going to say your prayers. And so... Um, the higher... that Well, I think I hear the Holy Ghost saying the higher up, the more like the sacrifices have to be like more serious right more bloody like, yeah cool. um you know um so i'm practicing i was practicing in the suburbs of chicago but if i had been in nigeria you know they do they do they do human sacrifice you know what i'm saying they and the thing is is like it might look like what i was doing in ifa but it's the same thing when there's a teenager who's depressed and she's cutting her arm it's blood sacrifice there's a demon there there's a spirit there that is requiring blood. Maybe she didn't do no divination with um, cowrie shells or sand or coconut shells, right? Um, but maybe she had tarot cards or maybe she's reading angel numbers or maybe she is just depressed and can hear cut yourself. It's still blood offering. 
You know what I'm saying? So yes, I'm explaining what it looks like in the false religion I was practicing, but the devil's tactics are the same across the board. Okay, it's the same thing when people jump from the roof and when they kill themselves. Those are human sacrifices. That's the other thing that people don't understand about getting involved and in celebrating things like Halloween and you open your children up to those things. They can later on, you know, they might be seven going trick or treating, but you don't know what incantations went forth that night that set them up to be a sacrifice when they're 18 and they commit suicide. That still registers in the spirit realm as a sacrifice. Okay, so. I digress, but I was participating full on in this religion. I'm doing incantations. I'm praying in Europe, but I had lived in a studio apartment. I had about seven altars in my studio apartment. I had about seven shrines um, because I told you I got initiated. So during that initiation time, it was eight days, supposed to be three. The spirits extended it, ended up being eight days. I'm naked, wrapped in white sheets, um, doing rituals morning, noon, and night. Complete silence. I'm not, I don't speak. I'm mute for eight days. No talking. So um, what, what were they doing? You was in sheets and what were they doing? To, why, why you was um, You sleep on the floor. You sleep on the mat on the floor. They just do rituals. So they might open up. So like the first night I made offerings to my ancestors. They said I had some grandmothers who were previous priestess of Oshun that I need to make an offering to them. Somebody, you know, and during the practice, like people get mounted, people get possessed. But during ceremonies and stuff, you know, there's drumming. The drumming is what calls the spirits. The drumming is what brings the spirits in and asks them to come. Um, there's certain drumming uh cadences that they have to be completed um and the spirits are very so, so they tell you that these spirits are for you these are your gods of your ancestors they're for you but you make one false move and see how they turn on you do you see what i'm saying so if these are supposed to be malevolent i mean benevolent helpful spirits but if you don't follow their steps or their orders you could die somebody could die you do those things you follow the, the, the this, you follow the teachings, you follow the steps, you follow the orders that they give through divination, right? And then they will come, they ride people so they can fully take over certain people's bodies, right? I've seen people eat glass. I've seen people burn their flesh, like set their flesh on fire and not be hurt. So there are supernatural things happening, that, but also too, these demon spirits, they don't come to you and be like, ha, 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 I'm a demon. No, they laugh and talk with you like how me, you, you laughing and talking right now. The voices may change, right? So it could be riding a woman and she would speak with a different, a completely different voice. That's not hers, right? But they smoke cigarettes. They drink wine. You want to have, they tell you beforehand through divination what kind of wine to have. And if you have those things, they will come and they will drink that, drink that liquor with you. Wait, 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 wait. So the demons, because we got, I gotta get clarification, my lord, today, Jesus. Mind you, and I'm gonna tell you because all this ties into pledging sororities as well. But keep going. I, I was gonna ask. So you said that the demons, like they were, you were talking like how we talking right now. They were mm -hmm. smoking. They was drinking. So were these actual demons that looked like that were like humans? They look like humans, or you they come in. They they come in spirit form. We talking about unclean, disembodied spirits. That you invite into the into where you wherever you are, and you give them permission to take over another person's body. Another person's body. Because it's a privilege in this community, in this setting, in this religion, it's a privilege to be a priest or a priestess that gets mounted by these spirits. So if you get rid, if you're riding, if they're riding you, you are privileged amongst the community. So if, if they come into you, you are privileged. <laughs> Allegedly. <laughs> oh my lord. Did they, did they ever come into you? Mm -mm. No. I was not one that could be ridden for whatever reason. Come on, Holy Ghost. Thank God, yeah. Um, now, that don't mean I, I had to get some cast out of me. Now, don't get me wrong, but yeah. I kind of wanted it, though. Like, I, they, they was you kicking it. Friends. Yeah, you want yeah, to. You don't. You, I'm a man, girl. I'm a man. Let's go. I'm tripping. So that's what, about, that's what the Holy the Holy Ghost wanted me to ask you about your mind during that time period, that eight days. How was your mind? 
during the eight days, you know, I kept waiting. I kept looking for some supernatural encounters for me. I kept looking because you're in the darkness. I'm sleeping in a room. There were probably over 30 or 40 altars in the room I was sleeping in. I didn't even really know what an altar was. Like in my mind, I probably pictured like these deities sitting up on invisible deities sitting up on these shrines. I didn't really know. But yes, there's and and the, the shrines have like dried up blood on them, dried up feathers, animal parts. You know, you can see some of that stuff. For the most part, though, they're decorated. So if it's a shrine for Obatala, it's usually white and silver. They make these things very pretty. You know what I'm saying? They'll they'll put like some fancy material, some tool, or some organza around it to make it pretty, sequins, glitter, whatever they do to decorate it. But there are offerings there. There's dried up decomposing fruit there, you know, from years of sacrifices to these shrines. And I'm sleeping in the midst of this. There's fruit flies flying around, you know. <laughs> it's kind of nasty. And also, even from the first night of my initiation, from the sacrifices that night, there was blood on my sheet, you know, feathers and because they pour these things on you because I'm also the sacrifice. I'm presenting myself, during initiation, I'm presenting myself to be a vessel for these spirits. I'm presenting, I'm being sacrificed for the purpose of becoming a priestess. I'm trying to elevate in this spiritual system, okay? So <clears throat> um, they cut out some of my hair, use that as part of whatever they do, whatever juju they doing. You know, um, yeah. So it goes on. And during the time, the the people who own the house, the owners of the shrine or the ile, they call it in Europe, but it's a house. The owners of that house are taking care of me. They're feeding me. They're visiting back there with me. They're talking to me. I can't talk back to them, but they're very kind and loving, very good people. And so, but I'm participating. And so then the time comes to do another ritual. Then they'll tell you, okay, this afternoon around one, we're going to do another ritual. We're going to do this one. Then tonight at seven, we're going to do this. Then in the morning, we're going to wake you up early, but you're not going to know where we're going. We're going to blindfold you. We're going to wrap you up. They put you in the car, take you to the river somewhere, do your baptism, you know, make you collect rocks from the bottom of the lake or where or the river, wherever you are, because those rocks are going to be used in your shrine. Have you making prayers? And you're doing rituals the whole time, day and night, day and night. Another ritual that I really was looking forward to was where they really kind of talk to you about your destiny. They really they do cut you do cuts in, I got cuts in my arm. Um, I got a special charm on my arm um, that shows the world that I've been. I'm an initiate. I'm a devotee of Ifa. So I'm getting identity from this. I'm hearing about my destiny, what I'm purposed to do. And I'll say this too. One of the other things that really drew me to this is I told you before, like the Baba Lawa was very fatherly, you know, um, being in the church and losing my father as a young girl. I did not have a father who I grew up with. My mother got married, yes, when I was young, but my stepfather rejected me. He did not treat me as his daughter. He did not love me. He did not dote on me. So even as I grew up in the church, even as I served in leadership, I worked at the church, even the church leadership made it difficult for me. They didn't, I, one time I asked one of the prophets, I felt that she was supposed to mentor me. She told me no. She said, I feel that that this could be good, that this could be something that God would want me to do, but I'm not going to do it. And she deliberately told me, she outright, outright told me, no, I'm not going to do it. So I was looking for someone to speak into my life. I was looking for a prophecy. I was looking for affirmation. I was looking for someone to say to me, thus said the Lord about your future. This is what he want to use you for. And I never had got that. So when I'm getting it in this ritual inside of this false religion, this is what I've been looking for. This is how important it is to have the prophets in place. This is why apostles are needed. This is why we need the fivefold. This is why we need pastors to shepherd people and bring them in and counsel with them. 
right? And people try to make it seem like like those things are overplay, overplayed and not really necessary. And no, even the whole church system of brothers and sisters is so needed. The relationship, the community is what keeps people from knocking on the, the doors of the devil. Do you see what I'm saying? So I was getting that inside of this false religion, looking forward to hearing what is my destiny. So I was getting that. Um, long story short, I got um, that Bible. I will end up getting sick during my initiation. He died shortly after that. He was never supposed to initiate me. I found out. What? Yeah. They say that when somebody falls sick during an, an initiation, it should stop. So I wore white for almost a year, head to toe white. Um, I mean, I was I got my during the initiation, I got my my hair shaved bald with a straight razor. They do like a series of baptisms. You jump in, jump out. I mean, it's a whole on like these are rituals that you're doing. Mm, this know. is how God brought me out. Come on, come on. Um, I'm I'm traveling. I'm doing offerings in Jamaica, Cuba. You know what I'm saying? I'm living it up. Before I go to these places, I make offering. I get divination, make an offering. Before I go, make sure I got safe travel. You know, I make offerings while I'm there. I met a man. So I went to Cuba in March of 2017. I met my husband at the beginning of April in 2017. And he he's Nigerian, um, Yoruba. And I thought he was fine. Right. So I'm like, OK, he thought I was Nigerian. So he's like, OK, I could connect with her. I had to like convince him, dude, I'm not Nigerian. Like I'm from the south side of Chicago. I could just speak a little Yoruba. I got Nigerian imports in my apartment. He knows that I'm, you know, what I'm saying studying Yoruba and all this stuff. So and I had changed my name. So I got when I got initiated, I got a new name um, after one of the deities. Right. It was Eshu Yemi which means um, Eshu is fitting for her. But Eshu is, the, is the, the equal of Satan. But they don't teach that. The Yoruba system don't teach that. But that's what the, the common understanding is, okay? So my husband, when he saw that, he was like, yeah, nice to meet you, but I'm never calling you that name. And I'm like, why? He's like, do you know what that name mean? I'm like, yeah. He said, I'm never using that name for you. And so he's, I was like, you do, you just brainwash. You don't know your own culture. You've been, you know, you've been colonized. You don't know. So I'm thinking that he's um, brainwashed, right? That he don't know his own traditional faith or whatever. He's like, yeah, I like you. But if you want to get together, then you got to go back to being a Christian. I'm like, never. So we ain't going to be together. But he kept calling me. <laughs> Pursuing me, and I'm liking it because he's fine. I think he cute. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's texting me like they not deities, they demons. And I'm like, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's the truth, man. I got. He was God used him, and so one time we got into a heated fellowship in my apartment. This man done moved in to my studio apartment, but he told me one time he was like, "You are deceived," but it wasn't his voice. It was as the voice of many waters. And I heard it. And I said, and I purposed in that moment, I said to myself, okay. I, I remember feeling like I sat down in my heart. And I said, okay, if he's right, I said, God, I don't know what I'm doing. But if what he's saying is right, I will change. And if it's wrong, I don't lose nothing. I keep doing what I'm doing. So right there, I opened myself up to the truth. And from there on, it, even from the first time I met him, because when I was like practicing the faith, they would tell you, tell me, burn my Bibles. We don't need that. It's not our book. So I told you I had been in, in ministry. I had two, you know, those trunks that college students use to go to school with. I had two of those full of Bibles, books, concordances, faith-based books filled and when I met him, I was like, hey, can you take these down to the dumpster for me? These got all my Amplified Bibles, all my different versions, right? All my parallel Bibles, everything. He's like, no, nah, keep that. <laughs> um, it was a it was a it was a progression since then. So now we're dating, and I'm like, okay, he wants me to go back to being a Christian, but 
In my mind, I'm thinking I'm still going to keep practicing E5. I'm just not going to tell him about it. I'm going to do my offerings. I'm going to get my divinations when I need to. And I'm going to raise our children after his tradition. He don't know it. This is what my wicked self was thinking. But God, God is so good. I end up sending back all the shrines to the Bible. Lab. I was scared to get rid of them myself. I should have burned them. But I was, a, I was, you know, I still wasn't thinking. But <clears throat> I ended up coming out of the religion and two weeks after we got married, I married him very quickly. Um, and so my mind, my decision making process during this time was very poor because if you meet a man in April and you marry to him by July, that's a concern. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that's not a normal progression of activities. Okay. But that's what I did. Um, and I thank God that he, that he was in the middle of it. Um, about two weeks after I married him, I opened my Bible for the first time in about four years. And it literally felt like a refreshing water to my physical body. Like I had been in a desert and somebody gave me water for the first time in four years. And I, my physical body was refreshed. And I knew from that, that was like a personal miracle for my life. I said, this is one of those times, this is a turning point in your life that a person will never forget. And I said, I know from this moment, no matter what anyone says, this is not just a regular book. And from there on, you know, God just pulled me out. I started going back to church. I repented. You know, I didn't really know everything that I had done. But, you know, and my, my mind was foggy. I remember I, I purchased a building at that time. Um, not a good idea. I mean, when you are in idolatry, your mind is so, I, I knew this coming out of it, how foggy my mind was. Um, and so after I purchased the building, I look back, I'm like, why did I do that? That was a bad decision. You know, so I'm making, I have a series of, of bad decisions that I was making. What was um, the building for? It was like a, a residential apartment building. For what? What you buying for? To live in and to rent out. For it like, for ghetto. it was like right in front of some projects. <laughs> was it for the religion or just for just anybody just for me for you mm -hmm. okay. it was an investment property okay okay but it wasn't a wise part you know what i mean mm -hmm. i'm just showing that you know like yeah somebody could say like no those are your decisions but i think people don't really understand the influence that demons play in people making bad decisions right mm -hmm. Um, here I am, someone who have gone through all these rituals and invited all these spirits into me, right? And think it don't affect your decisions. Yes, it does. But God is so good. He was he was still with me. He never left me. The other thing I forgot to tell you is during the um, initiation period, probably about on day four, day five, I had a vision in the nighttime. I was sleeping and God let me hear the cries of the saints. Going, He gave me a vision of his throne. And the saints were going up as smoke. The prayers of the saints were going up as smoke. They were calling out my name and praying for me. And I and my heart was hard. And I remember saying, I don't know what you're showing me this for because I don't come too far now. I'm not turning back. This is what I'm doing. But it was another marker of God saying to me, somebody's praying for you. Somebody's interceding for you. And that it was mercy because his throne is the mercy seat, that there, that there were prayers going up to the mercy seat for me. So here I am blaspheming the name of Jesus, and he's, he's receiving prayers for me. He's showing me his mercy. He could have took my life on that floor, naked, with animal blood on me, so, so cocky and arrogant in my sin that I would tell them, if I die, don't let my mother bury me in Jesus' name. Completely apostate. But God, his mercy endures forever. And, and he saved me. He chased me. He sent a young knucklehead from Nigeria. My husband had been here for four months before I met him. My husband, when he told me, he didn't even know he needed to wear gloves in Chicago in the wintertime. He ain't know nothing about no winter. Frostbitten fingers. He, he trying to catch a ride. He hitchhiking on the south side of Chicago at four o'clock in the morning. 
God spared his life so that he could minister to me to bring me out of deception. That's the providence of our God. That's the compassion and the foresight and how he sets things in order and how even when I didn't want to be kept, he kept me. <clears throat> because my heart was broken because I thought he left me. See, remember, that's why I got into all of this, right? So now I'm coming out. I'm still grieving about losing my job. That happened in 2014. It's 2017. I'm still crying almost every day about losing my job. So <clears throat> get married. My, I have a friend. She's still my friend today. I love it. This is how I know she's my friend. Because she told me in 2017, Delena, it happened. It wasn't right. You need to get over it and move on. It's time to move on. And it was hard for me to hear it. And I said, okay, she right. Let me move on. So 2018, I started going back. To, I started going to church up the street. I don't even know how I found out what a deliverance ministry was, but I somehow got involved in deliverance class. And they started talking about false doctrines. I think it's a scripture in Timothy that talk about, um, you know, going to and fro with every wind of doctrine. And now we don't had a class where we learned about what it feels like for manifestations to occur. Girl, why I start manifesting in the class? When they start talking about false doctrine, that's how I knew. I'm like, oh, this ain't me. I knew I needed, that's how I knew I needed deliverance. It had never occurred to me that after doing all that stuff that I would need deliverance. I still had, I still had clothes from rituals in my house. I still had I actually still had a, my ephah shrine, my pot. That's the only one I kept. I still had a shrine. I still had the stuff with my hair in it. Like, you know, they wrap up all these scarves. and I still had stuff in my house, accursed items in my home. I didn't know. <clears throat> so I go through a deliverance process, right? I thank God for my church then. Um, I thank God for deliverance ministries. because And churches need to have deliverance ministries because people need to be set free. And by the power of Jesus. And so they led me through deliverance, but the deliverance period stopped. And I could see, like, there were times where I felt like I could see myself going through the deliverance. I could hear the spirits talking. You know, I had to renounce all of the Orishas and stuff. And it stopped because I didn't notice at the time, but they told me, they was like, you in a sorority? I was like, yeah. It was like, you know, you're going to have to renounce the sorority too. And I was like, why? The sorority ain't got nothing to do with the false religion. Like, why should I renounce the sorority? It's good to me. I'm still active. It's good. You know, it's community service. <clears throat> she said, no problem. Um, we're not going to make you do it. There's going to come a time when you're going to want to. But for now, this is as far as we can take you in the deliverance process. What? So how was, how was deliverance like the... Can you talk about a little bit of that? Like yeah. deliverance, getting all of that casted out of you? Like, yeah. what So it started off with me having to do some write-ups. Like they open up with assessments, right? Because they need to know what you're dealing with. So I was having rage. I was having hatred, murder. I was seeing myself murdering people in my mind. You know, I couldn't stop cursing. I was struggling with pornography. You know what I'm saying? I was struggling. I had issues, right? Um, so I wrote all that up. I told them everything. They went through it. They counseled with me. They talked with me. And then it was prayer day. Called me down to the basement. They had their team set up. They had some folks over there that would watch my baby for me and pray with her. They had another team over in the corner, a couple people over there on prayer in the seat. Then they had about three people. One is a point man who does out the calling out of the spirits and the other people speak in tongue, pray, get the tissue, get the buckets and all like that. And they, they led me through renouncing the legal rights, right? Talking about, I renounced the vows I made. I named all the Orisha. I named every practice. I named every sin. I'm confessing, repenting, you know? <clears throat> um, so they removed all the legal rights and they start calling them out. And the one that I remember the most was a cursing. It was a cursing spirit. And I, re I remember it because 
the elder had to come in from another room. I remember she put her thing on my forehead like this and she was like, shut up. Cause he was screaming so loud through my voice. My, my throat was so raw from that, the screaming. He was trying to tear me. So she told her to shut up. You will not tear her. And she, I remember she said, go back down. But you know, they was, they was calling them out, out of my spine, out of my back, you know, and I, they was coming up because I was, I was done. But when it stopped was when they stopped because they still had legal rights from my vows, from my oaths to the sorority. Some of them, it, that's why it became such a struggle for some of them because they had a right to be there. I wasn't giving up. I didn't know that I was still connected to false gods. I didn't know that the oaths were a problem, but they were a problem. They were spiritual, um, giving them legal rights to occupy my body still and access to my bloodline. So a couple more years, that was in 20, probably end of 28, no, early 2019 that happened. Early spring 2019. I knew that pledging had opened up doors to... I knew it had opened up doors in my life. I considered that the sorority was greedy. They always want more. They want more time. They want more money. They want more effort. They want more of your individual resources. You can never do enough inside these organizations. So and even I had consulted, in, before I joined, I consulted with a member who was a Christian. I asked her, do you think there's anything wrong with it? Do you think there's anything demonic with it? And she was like, no, she wasn't active, but she was the one that told me that they're greedy. She was the one that told me that if you you need to know what you're getting into. And so I knew that I was connected to other women who were not believers. I was connected to other women who were not walking in holiness. And I knew that that had had some type of effect on my walk with with Jesus. But I wasn't. I wasn't completely solid in that. You know what I'm saying? Because this is why the scripture says, be not together, be not uh, be not un believers it's it's about it's not that's not just talking that's not talking about dating and marriage that's talking about all your relationships with unbelievers you can't be yoked up together with somebody who's not living for Jesus Christ and think it's not going to affect you and so i knew that the that the sorority had opened up doors that my membership was affecting me there was a member who i knew was cheating on her husband and the holy spirit would say to me so are you an adulteress too because you are connected with well, she's your sister. One thing I want to I want to go over this poem. One of the poems in Sigma Gamma Rho <clears throat> is called My Sister's Keeper. And this is what the Holy Spirit held up to me and says, is this still who you are? You know, is this a part of you? See, and you learn this when you're online, right? And sorority members say it all the time that probates and whenever. I am my sister's keeper. What she does, I do. What she knows, I know. If she is unable to do it, so am I. If she does not know it, neither do I. We are one. All for one, one for all or none. I shall never forget this as long as I shall live. Sigma stay together, win together, lose together, and die together. If I am to keep this as my motto, then I can be a true Sigma. So this, this confession by the members of this sorority, we are bound together in marriage. My affections are to this sorority. And when I look up affinity, I looked up the word affinity. It says not a blood relation, a, but a connection, especially through marriage. That's what the that's what the one of the definitions for affinity is. This sorority, I have an affinity for this sorority. I have love and affection for this organization. Throughout my 12 years, this is how I felt. So when people, I had a, my god sister sent me a denouncing video. I got so offended. She sent that to me in like 2020, 2021. I almost cut her butt off. Stop talking to her. Because who do she think she is that she should suggest that something is wrong with my sorority. I chose this sorority on purpose. I did not choose Delta. I did not choose AKA 
for those very reasons. I chose the right one, right? In pride. This is how all of these organizations, when people join these organizations, they really think they joined the right one. They think they made the best choice, baby. What these other folks is doing, they don't know. They silly. And so the, the running the running gossip amongst the D9 members is SG Row is low, low on the totem pole, right? You take that organization because you couldn't get into the other ones, allegedly. But inside of SG Row, those women genuinely chose that organization for reasons. This is a conviction. So you couldn't tell me that it was something wrong with my sorority. Do you see what I'm saying? It was meeting my needs. It may have been costing me thousands of dollars over the years, but it was meeting my needs for connection, for sisterhood. I didn't have no bad experiences in that organization. I'm willing to confess that I died with other Sigma women. I had no, why would I say that? Do you see what I'm saying? The depravity, the casualness of that. And, and, and then, as I was coming out of it, <clears throat> so, okay, so my sister sent me that link, and I'm like, I ain't watching this. I said, but you, then the Holy Spirit said, what you got to lose? So I watched it. <clears throat> now I started getting my interest peaked about the boule because I'm seeing it from the perspective of Black culture, right? How do we have these nine organizations that have been around for over 100 years, and this group of people is not really making progress in this country? Let's talk about the boule. So in the Sigma Gamma Rho um, membership process, they do have a section where they briefly teach on the boule. And I had talked to other Black Greeks, and they weren't getting taught about the boule in their interest, in their, yeah, <clears throat> in their in their process. So I'm like, well, why would SG Rho teach us about the boule? So I started watching YouTube videos, uh, like Stephen Coakley, like all these like investigative journalists about this boule organization. So that's how I really started. That's how I really started my process to denounce it. Right. Because I'm like, OK, what is the boule and why did they they told us about it for a reason? I know that in the spirit, you need to unveil certain things to alleviate the blame. Right. To put some of the onus on the individual. So um, boule start getting into that. I'm like, OK, this is a level of secret society. And perhaps everybody, you know, people don't know how these things are ordered, how these things are set up. So now I start getting into masonry. And I didn't really understand why people would say that the D9 are offshoots of masonry because they never talked about that. I didn't think that was true. I'm like, these are just people on the outside, garbage talking about things they don't know about. And by now I'm like, well, now I understand why A5A and DST and AK. Now I know what's wrong with those. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with my one that I chose because the one I chose is perfect. And they don't have these same blasphemous things. And I don't read the rituals for all of the other ones. There was no mention of false gods or goddesses. I tried, look, I tried to burn my ritual book, but it wouldn't burn all the way, girl. <laughs> it was in the barbecue grill and I had to go back out and get it. So the pledge, it says to the only Sigma Gamma Rho, I pledge my life, my best efforts and cooperation. In thee, I pin my faith, hope, trust so that the order of Sigma Gamma Rho shall be a beacon of light to all womankind who are interested in every phase of education. So I'm going to stop there. If it's posted on the internet if people want to read it. It's hard for me to read it. You know what I mean? But the one thing I want to point out is it didn't necessarily change the scriptures like the AKA pledge. So I thought I was okay. And I thought that the other women who had renounced Sigma Gamma Rho just wanted to be like the bigger sororities. They just wanted to be important. They want to be like the deltas that came out. They don't really know that it's nothing really wrong with Sigma Gamma Rho. They just want to, they just want camera time. You know, because the inside of the SG Row chat rooms is the poodles going to get their camera time, right? So I rationalize in my mind that it's nothing wrong happening here. People just want to fit in. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that. Now, I said if God wanted me to denounce, I would, but I don't see why he would want that because it's not as bad as the other ones. So I'm getting this information, Masonic information, secret societies, Boule, the other Greeks, and... It's not really affecting me. I'm just like, oh, okay, whatever. I get it. 
they should have denounced. They should have pledged in them row. Fast forward to the summer of 2022. I enroll my daughter in a Christian school, which happens to be also at a church. And every time I would go there to tour the school, orientation, first day of school, I would wear Perry. And I started, I noticed one time, like about the second time it happened, I felt naked. I felt like I should cover my clothes. And I was like, why do I feel weird up in here today? So this, the third time it happened, first day of school, the principal asked me, she said, oh, I see you got on your sorority because I said, yes, that's right, girl, blue and gold, the colors of achievement, just boasting, walking right in the sanctuary. Girl, yeah, relax with all that. <laughs> <laughs> Doing too much, right? Recruiting, I'm evangelizing because that's what I was always doing. I was always looking for women to bring in. Who's got quality? Who's got good character? Who's sisterly? Who can I tell about the good news of Sigma Gamma Rho? That I haven't had any bad situations happen to me. That I love it. That they're kind. That they're friendly. That we serve. This is what I was doing. I was evangelizing. And I was proud about it. But I felt naked again. I, like I should put my coat on backwards and cover up my letters. And I walked out. I dropped my baby off at school. I walked out. I said, God, what just happened? I'm not in sin. I'm not sleeping with nobody. I didn't smoke. I didn't cuss. Why do I feel convicted? I said, this is conviction. What did I do? I started thinking. Did I not pay my tithes? I'm thinking. Girl, about a week later, I take off from work because I'm a mom of two now and I got mad laundry crib okay i got laundry that need to be washed i said let me take a, a day off and tackle this while i'm doing the laundry i'm playing youtube videos this old scrubby dusty poorly recorded video from a seven day at venice my, no i don't even know how I, girl why he started why video like, dusty <laughs> it was dusty it was old Nate was recording him from the balcony it was a hot mess so but he starts going down the history of secret societies, starting with the Roman government, how it becomes the papacy of the Catholic Church, down to the Jesuits, Knights of Templar, all the way down, skull and crossbones, Masonic orders, Shriners, down to the D9. He talks about what is the goal of each of these organizations? The Knights of Templar, the Jesuits, what, are, what is the goal? The KKK, what are all these groups trying to do as secret societies? And he connects them. He says how they begin to offshoot to another. Goes down the line. Says how they focus on the universal brotherhood and the universal fatherhood and the great architect of the universe, how they are making God common and making Jesus the same as Krishna and Buddha and leveling out the religions, but Jesus is the same. And that it's all about universalism and Luciferianism. He's connecting the dots and how that is inside the Masonic temples. All of the gods are, are on the same. They don't, they only care that you believe in a God. Doesn't have to be Jesus, right? Doesn't have to be the God, right? <clears throat> Just believe in a God. And so now he's saying, then he talks about the separation because of race, right? So now you have the Prince Hall Masons and now down to the D9. And he says a simple thing. He says, who is the father of masonry? It's Satan. He says, and if Satan is the father of the Freemasons and the Freemasons are the originators and the fathers of the D9, who is the father of the, of the divine man? It's Satan. My heart fell. I said, now I see the connection to the Masonic order, to other sequences, to the occult, to now these black fraternities and sororities, right? I said, but God, <laughs> Sigma Gamma Rho doesn't have any false gods like Minerva or Atlas, because he talked about those. He talked about the rituals and stuff. And he showed me in my mind, he showed me the crest. And that skull and crossbones on the crest never said well with me. Even from the time I joined, I asked them, 
what does this mean? And in the esoteric information, they tell you that it um, it says the skull and crossbones represents the call. But that's all it says. It doesn't tell you the call to what. OK, <clears throat> very vague. Again, just because you come into these organizations don't mean they tell you everything. OK, so a new initiate doesn't just not know information because they're new to the light, because they are neophyte. They don't just not know things because they knew. They don't know the same things that the higher ups are going to know. They don't know the same things that the people sitting at the world nations take because those leaders are at tables of world leadership for a reason. They don't know the same things. They have esoteric information that I believe we don't get as general members. OK, so. He says, so God says, I said, but they don't have a false God. He said, death is a God. And he showed me the skull and crossbones. He said, that's the symbol for death. I said, death is a God. He said, why do you think Jesus had to conquer it? Come on, Holy Ghost. Yeah. And that, and so in the, in the coat of arms, the crest, the shields for the organizations, they have to show you those symbols. Those symbols mean something. In the Masonic order, they mean something in the or in the world of symbols of the occult. Okay, and so <clears throat> even the things that they tell you that they mean on those shields are not full truth, because even like for example, because I've studied all of the organizations, even for like AKA, it will say Atlas. It don't say the Greek god Atlas. No, it just says this is the Atlas, and it means endurance. Do you see what I'm saying? But they're not giving you that Atlas is a Greek God. They're not telling you that his punishment was to carry the world, to stop um, stop the other gods from getting to the people. They're not giving you all those details, right? The mythology behind it. And so it's the same. Even for Sigma Gamma Rho, they'll say, um, they have on here that one of the symbols on the crest is the serpent of the medical staff, which means united, we stand, divided, we fall. But when God... Um, he told me this on August 22nd. So during that next day, he said, research every symbol on that crest. Dig. Dig it up. I said, okay. So I find that that's not the serpent of the medical staff on that symbol. On that crest, it had the serpent on the medical staff has um, one snake. That one has two. And so what it is is the caduceus or the staff of Hermes. That's what's really on that shield. So now I already see a symbol of a false god because I know who Hermes is, right? But it, I also noticed in my research that that symbol is the same symbol as the penis or, or the phallus on the statue of Baphomet, which is the universal symbol for the church of Satan. That Baphomet statue, which is like the man with the goat head and he's got the fingers one up, one down. Yes. So if you look at his phallus in between his legs, it's the same symbol that's on the SG Row coat of arms. I said, OK. So after the Lord said, OK, death is a God. Why do you think Jesus has to has to conquer it? I said, oh, and I heard him say, come out and don't go back. And as soon as he said, come out and don't go back, he immediately dropped in my spirit that that's what happened to my old mentor from the Christian sorority. I mean, nobody talked about, no, even still, it's not like her family called and told me this. I know they're going to be, if anybody sees, they're going to be pissed off that I'm saying this, but this is what was become known to me by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit revealed that to me, that he knew her heart and she was going back to the sorority after she had come out. And, he, and the Holy Spirit said, and don't go back. And he showed me that when he brings somebody out of these things and they go back, they up for death. These organizations have covenants with death. They may not have symbols of necessarily death on their coats of arms, but the wages of sin is death. So whenever you engage in sin, ignorantly or otherwise, you are susceptible to the judgment of God. Your name, your case can come up in the courts of heaven. And the accuser of the brethren can say, look at their sin. Look at their idolatry. Look at how they blasphemed you. Look at how they disregard your blood. They don't want you. Let me have them. 
and God is just. So if he's already, you know what I'm saying? We open those doors. The father said, come out and don't go back. It was August 22nd, 2022. Baby, I'm celebrating Centennial. You hear me? Huh. I was ready to kick it. Okay. I have just bought some new Perry. Lots of it. For a hundred years. Done made it. God didn't care nothing about that. And guess where it went? Straight to the trash. I tried to salvage it. I tried to see if anybody wanted. They was like, they was pissed with me. No, we don't want that. Cool. Trash. And it took me. So that night, I knew when he said, when he showed me the connection with that, I knew I had to make a decision. By that night, I was cleaning out my closet. I fully renounced. I, I didn't immediately jump into the renunciations. Um, I did the research the next day on the 23rd, but by the 24th, I was in prayer repenting. It took me two days. And I thank God that I wasn't one of the people that waited or needed a year or a month. You know what I'm saying? I thank God for my heart towards him and that he had been all alone, even since my deliverance in 2019, trying to show me that this was an error. <laughs> And so um, I had, you know, I had a daughter at the time who uh, my oldest daughter was like four at the time. And I had been training her. She knew how to eat. She knew how to do all that. I was preparing for her to be a legacy. The generational curse nobody wants to talk about. Right. It's a generational curse of idolatry. That's what the legacies are. OK, so I had to have her help me to destroy this Perry, help me get rid of this sick and gamma stuff because I needed to show her that God was purging us, that God was pulling us out of idolatry and cleansing our bloodline and that mommy had made a mistake, that mommy was in error, that I had sinned against the holy God. And um, and even the Aurora, they tried to. So, we you know, when the pledge clubs got abolished in the 90s, the Sydney Gamma Rose Pledge Club was officially called the Aurora Club. Okay. That was after the Roman goddess Aurora. But what they also have is the name of the magazine, the official magazine for the sorority is called the Aurora. That is not Aurora Borealis, the lights in Northern Ireland. That's not that. This is after the Roman goddess Aurora. There are connections to these guys throughout the organizations. So Sig and Gamma Rho has connection with Aurora, Death, and probably Hermes, because the staff of Hermes is on their crest. And some say also Ma'at, who is an Egyptian goddess. Um, it's not transcribed in the literature, but it's in the symbols. And I thought, you know, they say we are last created best design. That's, that's one of the taglines of Sigma Gamma Rho. But all that, all that really means in the spirit is it's very well hidden. The deception is very well hidden. Um, the Zetas are, is very deceptive as well because they don't say like, hey, we're connected to a best dead. No, but you see the image, you know, and they have like, you know, the, the, the Zeta light in the rituals and Sigma Gamma Rho is constantly talking about the beacon of light and don't hide. They're not talking about the light of Jesus Christ. It's all a counterfeit for what God is doing for his people. It's all a counterfeit for the Messiah. It's all meant to be a parallel to draw you away from God. Satan don't care if you bow down and worship him. You don't have to worship Satan. You just got to worship yourself. You just got to not worship the most high God. You just got to not to him only love, honor, and obey. To him instill your faith, hope, and trust, right? Just don't give it to him. You can keep it for yourself. You can esteem your own opinions and your own thoughts higher than what the word says. That is the idolatry that Satan cares about. So, yeah, they might say like, oh, we don't worship no false God. We're not worshiping our organizations. No, but you're worshiping yourself because here it is. The word is going out far and wide that you're in sin, but they hold on to what they believe is right. And there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end of that way is death and destruction. And it's time to come out because the father says this ain't him. It's not for his children. It's not for those who are set apart. And if you're washing your garments, if you're preparing to be the bride of Christ, 
this is a stain that's got to come out. So I'm, um, I took another day off of work in September 2022, do laundry again. <laughs> and I'm going in my walk-in closet. I'm like, okay, God, you know, I'm listening to denouncing videos. You know, I done already renounced on social media, all of that. And um, I was thinking, and I kind of heard God laugh. And I was like, you laughing at me? What's funny? You know, I said, I was thinking, like, I was thinking like, yeah, I never got an answer. I never fully understood why God didn't help me when I lost everything in 2013 and 2014. I never got an answer. And I said, oh, that's okay. I don't need an answer. I'm following Christ. I may not have all the answers, but I'm going where he take me. Right. But I heard him laugh. And he said to me, I left you to your idols. That's what he said to me. He said, let Sigma Gamma Rho and your sorority sister save you. Let Aurora save you. The gods of your covenant, let them save you. That's what he told me. And I didn't understand it until that day that because I bowed at the altar of initiation in 2010, that I cemented the separation between me and God, that he only dealt with me after that in his grace and his mercy. But he did he could not defend me. He chose not to defend me because I was in full-blown idolatry. That here I am thinking that God left me, that he disappointed me, when the fact is I left him to begin with. In my seeking of more, in my seeking worldly success, the jobs, the connections, the organizations, and bowing at that ritual, thinking nothing of it. They say, have the initiates to kneel down. Confess this. Dedicate your life. The pledge says, I dedicate my life, my best efforts, and my cooperation to further its cause. That's idolatry. And so the Lord, he showed me a scripture um, Isaiah 57 and 11. And I didn't know nothing about that. You know, I, I don't know if I ever had read that, but um, <clears throat> I'm going to read it right quick. But he showed me that and then I'm done. I, I came out and I, I follow what the Lord is saying. And I tell people whenever I can, um, don't be caught in sin. Don't be caught in that. Um, he says, and of whom have you been afraid or feared? that you have lied and not remembered me, nor taken it into your heart. It is not because I have held my peace. Is it not because I have held my peace from old that you do not fear me? He's saying, I didn't destroy you right away, right? Yeah, I could have been my old self and taken you out. He says, um, I will declare your righteousness and your works, for they will not profit you. All your service, your oath, your sisterhood, your scholarship, your service, they will not profit you. And for when you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you. Let your collection of poodles deliver you. Let your collection of elephants deliver you. You see what I'm saying? But the wind will carry them all away and a breath will take them. But he who puts his trust in in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. In this scripture, Isaiah 57, 11 through 13, he's drawing a distinction. He's saying that your idols can't save you. And that's what he was showing me. When he left me out to dry, he said, let them save you. Don't, how I'm going to look to El Elyon to save me and I bowed at the altar of another God. The other thing I learned through practicing the false religion, Ephi, is the elements that it takes to make an altar active. I didn't know that when I pledged, but that white tablecloth, the presence of the candles, the fire, the air, and when you kneel down, when you take the oath, you are the sacrifice. Those initiation rites formulate an altar. They tell you to put the pictures. Some people have pictures of the founders. For Sigma Gamma Rho, it requires a picture of the coat of arms. That's the focal point. That's what you put on the altars when you're making sacrifices to other deities, when you make an ebo. The altar setup is the exact same. It's no different. I was reading through the rituals last night. I got them out the barbecue grill. They didn't burn right away. I guess God was knew I was going to need them. 
But I'm looking through one of the parts of the ritual requires seven candles for singing in a row. And I'm looking, it's orange, red, blue, purple, gold, or yellow. I said, God, what is the significance of all these colors? You know what the Holy Spirit said? He said, it's the chakra colors. He said, this is, this is new age. This is witchcraft. And they're, they're not saying that. They're telling you like, oh, the red represents this and the orange is the heart's flame. And this. no, the Father, the Holy Spirit showed me last night. This is this is introduction to witchcraft. This the sorority you pledged in 2010 opened the door for you to to join a deeper occult. False religion of idolatry. In 2014. I don't even. Then I went and got the devils cast out from Sigma Gamma Row. <laughs> How about, okay. the church, high and low. Find me somebody to do deliverance because I, I had left that other church I was at and they wouldn't do it. They told me because I'm not a member there no more. They weren't going to do my deliverance. Shame on them. But Ooh. thank God. <laughs> yeah, they thought, wow. Well, That's not how it's supposed to go. It ain't. But I, I thank God because I found my current ministry, um, beautiful people. Very much walking in what how God intends for the church to function as a community to help people be safe and healthy. And um, I went, I said, Prophet Josh, I explained to them the situation. That man went in with love and gentleness and accuracy. He called out every spirit. Um, he saw the colors before I even saw. I didn't tell him what's the word. I didn't tell him he called it out. He said, I see it all over you. I'm, I end it. I sever the relationship, I sever the marriage, I break every covenant. And I had, you know, I had fasted before I knew what it would take because I had been going through training for deliverance years prior. I could never advance in the deliverance ministry that I was a part of before because I didn't know why, but this is why before, because I was still under false covenants. But yeah, did that. And um, honestly, I think people don't really also talk about the warfare that comes after you denounce. And if if it wasn't so serious, the enemy wouldn't be coming after us. You know, he comes to me in dreams, still try to get me to eat, try to reestablish the demonic covenants in my sleep. You know, um, you was about to say by having you eat and eat. Yeah. eat in your dreams, right? Eat things, sign things, uh, get you to put on Perry. And so even though I may not be a member physically, like in, in like I may have got a renunciation, did an exit interview and all of that. To him, he just wants to establish it in the spirit. He wants a reason to accuse me. He wants access to my bloodline. So you got to wake up and renounce those things. You still have to be fast. Huh? Okay, I'm saying get your nose. Your nose. Oh yeah, <laughs> girl, yeah. You still got to be fasting and preaching. <laughs> you still got to be fasting and praying. You know what I'm saying? Um, because it's all a part of it. It's all a part of it. It's all still in play. The enemy is relentless. Because what this does is it impacts how effective you are for the kingdom of God. Yes, we think we're doing it for the culture. Yes, we think this is black culture. This is who we are. But culture belongs to a kingdom. And does the culture benefit the kingdom of God or does it benefit the kingdom of darkness? And there is no in between. My father said, come out from among them and be ye separate. Touch not the unclean thing. And we got to check our affections. When we look at the bags, when we look at the coats, when we think about the meetings, when we hold hands and sing those songs, those things are attached to our affection. It's a marriage. The father doesn't want that for us. He don't want that for his children because he knows that in the end, when the wheat is separated from the tares, that we won't be able to go with him. That we won't be able to go with the sheep, but we would have to go with the goats. You can't have it both ways. I thank God for his correction because it hurt. It still hurt. I miss him. You know, I be thinking about people and I go to check and see how they doing, how their kids doing. They done unfriended me on Facebook. You know what I'm saying? That part is hard. But I have even coming out the identity issues. I felt so naked. I felt like I didn't belong. I didn't have, I, the identity struggle was real, but 
But I guess what? I found my identity in Christ. I finally know what it means to find my identity as a son. I didn't know what that meant before because my identity was in something else. But he stripped me down and I'm a son. I've been corrected. I've been pruned. I've been loved. I've been saved. God loves me. I know he loves me because he let me hear the truth. So praise God. And when you say as a son, you mean that that could, that's symbolic of, of as a woman and a man, right? Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. Either. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's you know, that's it's sonship. It's sonship. the principle of sonship. I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I ain't thinking about no gender. My gender is for here for God to accomplish purposes in the earth. But in the spirit, I'm a son. You understand what I'm saying? I'm I'm seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. I walk in the authority of Jesus Christ. He is my righteousness. He is my garment. He is my covering. He's my head. He's everything for me. You know, that's it. God. Oh, oh. <laughs> He brought me out. <clears throat> he brought me out. This is a powerful, powerful testimony. My mm -hmm. Lord, this is, this is the, the grace of God. Mm -hmm. He brought me out of idolatry, witchcraft. You know, I had no idea what I was doing. But God. But God. Mm -hmm. We praise God. Yeah, I went, when I denounced, I wanted to tell them, put my daughter's name on the list, too, because they're like, you know, you can't undo it. I wish I had told them, add my daughter's name too, so they can't play it. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Because it looks good, but it opens up the doors to wickedness. You know, the scripture says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, against rulers of darkness, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The sororities fall under rulers of darkness. You know, that, that desire for knowledge the desire for secrets, right? The pride, all of those things opens up the door. That's why it's seated. See, Satan works in the systems of the earth. He That is his way of working in the system of education, right? That's how he gets access to the young minds. And so for black people, what does he do? He picks out the best and the brightest of them. From, from 18, 19, 20 years old, 25 years old. And for the super thirsty ones, come at 40. Come at 45 and pledge. Let me take out all the best and brightest of this particular group of people and use them for my will. Use them for my purposes. Separate them from the God, from the creator who can bless them and bless them generation to generation. And he inserts an, an interruption there so that people cannot walk in the gifts that they're supposed to walk. They become defiled. The churches become altars of Baal. So you wonder why we have churches on every corner in our community, but they're not effective because they're altars of Baal. The pastors, the people who have the prophetic gifts have Masonic rings on their fingers. They've been beaten and pledged for six weeks. They barking and out owing and ooping. So how can the father move in our community? How can he absolve poverty and, and incest and wickedness and rape and shame? Because we're giving ourselves to idols. We got That's why we got to come out. We got to wash ourselves. This is not inconsequential for the kingdom of God. It's not inconsequential for souls, for people, for humans. These are memberships and these organizations give demonic access and prevent us from walking in the greatness of God, from walking in the fullness of his spirit. So, yeah. Thanks, Lala. <laughs> Girl, you, you just set up here, drop the mic. The Holy Ghost dropped the mic through you. My Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. This is so. phenomenal. Thank you. I'm so glad we got a chance to talk. And I just pray that um, I thank God for the people that have already come out, you know, who, who didn't say anything to me in the first place, but they saw it. And to the people that say, why just do your, why not just leave quietly? Uh, does a man light a candle and hide it under a bushel? No, we got to let our light shine. This is the light of Jesus Christ, the light of the world. So we tell about it to let his light shine. 
and his light brings freedom. And when the sun says free is free indeed, free. we got to tell it. We got an obligation. Yes, we do. We are commanded to yeah. testify and we are commanded to shine God's light. Amen. That's what, he's doing. that's what he's doing through you. Praise God. Praise yeah. God. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing your testimony, you. my Lord. Do you want to, um, do you feel led to say a prayer um, as we close, just for those that are watching, whatever sure. the Lord wants to pray for? Sure. Um, thank you, God. We love you. Thank you for loving us first. Thank you for leaving the rest of the flock to come and get your own, to come and get the one. Thank you for saving me. And now, Father, I pray that you will be glorified, that you will get something out of this, oh God, that what, what was meant for evil, God, I pray that you will turn it around for your good, that souls will be saved, that hearts will be softened, Lord God, that, that we would turn to you in holiness and righteousness and remember our first love, that we would come out of Babylon, that, that I bind mixture right now in the body, oh God. Every voice that speaks to us and says it's okay, that it's not that serious, I silence them now. Hallelujah. And I pray that the spirit of God will rise up in your people with fervor and passion, that they will come running saying, what must I do to be saved, Lord God? Draw your people by your spirit. In Jesus name, God, I thank you for everything you're doing. And we love you. And we say amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Thank oh, Lord, praise God. This testimony is going to go viral in Jesus name. It is going to go viral and touch many, 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 many people. Amen. And you know what, though? Because it's not, it's not, fam I don't want to be famous. I just want to be effective. You know what I mean? I just want God. So even if it don't, that's fine, too. I'm glad we got to connect. It was definitely an answer prayer. Um, and God, everything God does is good. One thing I learned how to say in the midst of all this is, Lord, all your judgments are right. That's it. He is a just God. I won't question him again. Mm -hmm. Everything he judges is right. Everything he does is good. And if I don't have all the answers, I still submit. I still bow to you, Lord, because he's my God. And now I will never have another. Amen. Amen. That is so good. Delina, do you want to share your Instagram or maybe oh. even Facebook for those that may want to reach or no? If um. you I don't know. If they if they reply to the video, I can respond. Um, if somebody wanted to um, reach, I think my Instagram username is Kynos. Again, it's K I K A I N O S. It's the um, Greek for new creature. So I'm a new creature again. And um, but yeah, it's Kynos again. And I think I, I think that's my name under there. But if they have questions and want to reach out or something, I'll be paying attention to the comments. Praise God. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you again. So definitely, if you have you know a question or comment or whatever, just leave it in the uh, comment area, and Delana will respond, and I'll, I'll pop in too and respond if I can. And so, mm -hmm. thank you again for saying yes to God and being bold for the Lord. I promise you this day, I feel it in my spirit. It is going to go up um, for the glory of God. It's not for your glory. Yeah. It's for the glory of Jesus. Because whatever he, you want to do. Beginning to the end, he is in this testimony, just moving. I felt him yeah. moving. And he was something. I was about to tell you to stop so I can go shout. Wait, because I felt the Holy. I felt the Holy Ghost on me. I was like, "My Lord, get me together, get me together." <laughs> so we praise God. We praise God for how He is moving through yeah. and moving through your words and moving through this testimony. Thank you. So, thank God. you. Again for saying yes and thank y'all so much for watching don't forget to like subscribe and comment bye, bye. <laughs> my lord <laughs>